It's time for us to begin our evening worship. Uh, if you would, please come on in and we'll, we'll get started. If you're visiting with us, we, we're especially glad that you're here. Uh, we pray that you will come back and be with us at any opportunity that you can. Opening song this, this afternoon is on uh, page 191. 191. Let's continue to remember our, our handouts that we was given uh, this morning. Let's continue to remember those that are standing in need of prayer. We need to continue to keep them on our prayer list. Let's continue to remember the one, the upcoming events that we have uh, throughout uh, the month as well. Uh, just a reminder, this evening, uh, after uh, evening worship, uh, Call Care Group number two uh, will be meeting. That's Alan Bates and, and John Mark Bridges, this group will be meeting. So let's continue to remember, like I say, the ones that are standing in need of prayer. So, But before we begin, uh, let's begin with the... A word of prayer, if you would, please. Father God, we are so thankful, Father, for this day and the blessings that you can continue to store upon us, Father. Father, we hope, trust, and pray, Father, that the, this service, Father, will be pleasing, accepted, and according to your holy word, Father. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you continue to bestow upon us, Father. But we thank you most and all, Father, for your son, Father, the redeeming blood that he gave up on Calvary's cross, Father. Father, that this day would not be possible, Father, had he not given his life so freely upon that cross. Father, we thank you for this avenue of prayer that we have, Father, that we can come to you, Father. For all the needs that we have, Father, that we can lay them upon you, Father. The fears, Father. The worries, the concerns, Father. Father, we know we lay them upon, your, upon you, Father. You are willing to, to handle them for us, Father. Father, we continue to pray for our sick of our number, Father. We pray that, Father, if you would, Father. Look to each and every one of them, Father, the things that they stand in need of. Bless them, Father. Strengthen them, Father. Build them up, Father. Father, continue to pray for those who have lost loved ones, Father. We pray that you continue to bless them, Father. Strengthen them, Father. Give them understanding of these things, Father. Father, we pray as a family that we will, we will lean on them, Father, that we will love them, care, and show them how much we love them, Father. Father, we pray for this country that we live in, Father. There are many things that are going on in this country, Father, but we pray most of all, Father, for our leaders. We pray, Father, that it is your will, Father, that they will, they will look to you, Father, for guidance in the things that they will do, Father. Father, the things that they do that affect your people, Father. Father, be with us in this hour of prayer. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless Gary and our ministers, Father, that come forward, Father, Logan and, and Derek, Father, and also Ed, Father. We pray that you continue to strengthen them, Father. Build them up, Father. Father, we pray that they receive the support that they need, Father. Father, we pray that we will be the people of love, Father, a people of humility, and everyone that we meet, Father, that some lost soul, Father, that may not know you, Father, may want to know, Father, why we are living our lives the way we are. Father, we continue to ask so many blessings, Father, but we thank you so much now, Father, for your Son and our Savior, Father. Forgive us, Father, when we fall short of your will, as we turn and repent of those things. And it's your name we do humbly pray. Amen. <clears throat> Sing verses 1 and 3. One ninety one. And then we say, In for the bride we have striven.
next election be hymn number 12. <coughs> See all four verses.
Good evening. Good to see everyone this evening. You may wonder what I do every every time. When I came here, Dale Ledbetter said, I want to have a voice recording of everything you do. And I started then doing it, and other people have since then caught on, and they want it. I even send them sometimes overseas or wherever. So I, I try to be sure to always start that recorder, and it doesn't always behave like I want it to. So uh, that's why occasionally I hesitate just a little bit. Good to see you. Good to be together. Uh, you know, if you're like me, you, you've seen these commercials or you've, uh, maybe you've received an email where somebody wants you to watch and the individual that is promoting whatever they're promoting is saying, if you do this, you will. And boy, they make all kinds of promises. Uh, you know, you're going to be the richest person in the world. Of course, the way you get that way is you buy the book that makes them rich. So you, but nonetheless, you know, that, those are the kinds of things that come along. They want you to believe that happiness is found in money or that happiness is found in just doing whatever you please. Uh, the reality is quite different. We began to look at that this morning as we looked at uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, where the Apostle Paul gives us effectively... God's formula for happiness. We noted in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, that that formula begins with rejoice in the Lord. I want to remind you uh, that the Apostle Paul, some 156 times in 13 letters, says something about in the Lord. He knows that in the Lord is critical. That's where you've got to be. And the only way to get to be in the Lord is to be added by the Lord to the church, uh, as Luke describes, Acts chapter 2, verse 47. The church is his body, as we understand from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Who does he add to the church? Go back to that Acts 2, 47. He adds the saved. How do you get to be saved? You go back to Acts 2, 2 38, and you learn that to be saved, you've got to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. So there's how you get to be in the Lord. And happiness begins that way. And we noted that this morning as we looked at the Ethiopian nobleman following his baptism. But then also, we've got to be patient in spirit. Uh, rejoicing and patience may not seem to go together. We talked about that this morning. Uh, but the reality is they do. This is a gentleness. Uh, this is putting up with the intolerable, tolerating the intolerable. Why? Because we want to be like Jesus, who did that very thing when he came to earth and died so that we might live. Then we noted that you also must remember, do not worry. Do not worry. This word uh, anxious or anxiety, don't have any anxiety, none at all. How are we going to avoid it? Well, he explains it. But pray. If we're not going to worry, how are, we going to, how are we going to deal with it? We're going to give it to the Lord. We're going to meet him face to face. And we looked at that as we closed out the lesson this morning, that that is the exact idea behind what is written there in, uh, in Philippians chapter 4, and verse 6. Now, having seen all, all those things, we need to go on to realize that if you want to be happy, you got to think on the right things. you got to think about the right things. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. I want to read this verse 8 again. I know Thomas did that this morning, but listen again to what he says. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You know, the world wants you to think about a lot of stuff. Uh, particularly, they want you to think about whatever they're selling. You notice that? Now, they want to have that ingrained in your mind, and they work very hard to achieve that. You know, they've got a sketchy slogan or some character that acts in a certain way that just attracts attention 
uh, to their product. And I want you to remember the product, not the, not the character. The product is what they want you to focus on because that's where it is. Well, we don't need to go there. Instead, we need to think on, listen to what he said, true things. What are we talking about when we talk about true things? Well, the, the idea is really the Word of God. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In John chapter 8, verse 32, he said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know, I can't think of anything that would make anybody happier than to know they're free. Not free just on, in a particular country or something like that. We're talking about free from sin. We're talking about free so that one day you can spend eternity with God. Well, how's that achieved? It's achieved in the truth. But if you want to know the truth, what do you got to do? You got to focus on the Word of God. Because that's where the truth is found, is in focusing on the Word of God. Brethren, we simply must return to the Bible. It used to be that, that every member of the Lord's church was a regular, daily Bible reader. That's not so true anymore. It's unfortunate to be able to say that, but it's not. We need to become, again, a, a people who love the book, who read it constantly. Why? Because we're supposed to be thinking about true things. But he goes right from that word true, and he goes on to say noble these are lofty, majestic things, things on high. And when I read the Apostle Paul, I think Colossians chapter 3 is a great example of that. Look at beginning at verse 1, what the Apostle Paul says. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Uh, I'm just curious how it worked with you. I can tell you how it worked with me. Uh, Teresa and I got engaged in, uh, in the second part of my sophomore year. And that summer, I went to work in Jackson, Tennessee. Not Jackson, Mississippi. Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, that was about uh, two and a half hours from where Teresa was. But now, I mean, I had a job. I was working as, a, as an associate, and they kept me busy. You know, running to Nashville was not really on the agenda. You want to know where my mind was? Is in Nashville. That's where it was. I was thinking about, about that pretty blonde in Nashville. Uh, the whole time. I could do my work and still think about that. That's where my mind was. Well, brethren, you know, we're looking forward to what? We're looking forward to heaven. We're looking forward to what is above. Shouldn't we be thinking about it all the time? Shouldn't that be a focus of ours? Think about noble, lofty, high things. And then think about just things. And there we have the idea of righteous, doing what is right. You may, uh, may remember that in Psalm chapter 119 and verse 172, right toward uh, the end of that great chapter, he says, My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Now think about this now. Are you starting to put together that if you were to start with truth, that you're talking about the Word of God? If you're talking about high things, noble things, that you're going to learn that from where? The Word of God. If you're talking about things that, that are, are righteous, are virtuous, what are you going to have to think about? Well, the Word of God. It, it goes right down the line, doesn't it? Every one of these things comes through a focus on the Word of God. He goes ahead, and next he says that we ought to focus on pure things. Now, it's interesting that the word here translated pure is hagnos. And the only reason I bring that up is that's the word for holy. That's what that is. 
Now, that reminds us that Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, that God said, he's quoting from the Old Testament, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, how do we learn about that? Well, guess what? Word of God. <laughs> That's how we're going to learn about it. We learn about the purity. We're le learning about being free from sin, being totally good, at least striving to be that, like our Father is. We need to be pure, morally undefiled, like God is. And then also, we need to think about lovely things. And the word there is literally an idea, whatever calls forth love. Now, you know what? What I immediately think of when I think of what calls forth love? I think about the assembling of the saints. That calls forth love. Being with family calls forth love. I think that's exactly what the writer is, is thinking about in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Uh, when he says to them, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If we're going to think about the things that promote love, we need to be with the people we love. We need to be with the God we love. We need to be thinking about the Son of God, whom we love. And all those things take place in the assembling of the saints. No wonder the writer of Hebrews said, don't desert the assembly. Now that, fellas, you young people, that's not D-E-S-S-E-R-T. -S -S -E like sweet, sweet thing. No, no, it's, it's not that. It's D-E-S-E-R-T, desert, like like running away from the army, A-W-O-L, that kind of thing. Don't be A-W-O-L from the assembling of the saints. Why not? Because in that, you and I are going to encourage each other to greater love, to doing what God wants us to do, thinking on lovely things. And where do we learn about that? Well, the Word of God. <laughs> Same place. We learn about these assemblies from the Word of God. We learn about singing from the Word of God. Doesn't that singing encourage you? Doesn't it lift you up and make you think on lovely things? We sang about some lovely things tonight as we, as we sang together, and we did this morning as well. And then he says, of good report, both the New American Standard and the English Standard there, instead of the word good report, put commendable. What's commendable in life? Well, think about what the Apostle Paul said to the young preacher in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. Where are we going to learn about commendable works? We're going to learn in the Word of God. <laughs> He's going right down the line. And, you know, he could have put this in a different way. He could have just said, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. Because that's what he's going down all the way through. He's helping us to see you need to go to God's Word, love it, absorb it, make it a part of your life. You know, brethren, if you do that, you'll learn that Scripture just pops into your head. Uh, Brother Gus Nichols was an interesting uh, character. He studied the Bible five hours a day, every day. Five hours. Now, I will tell you, he didn't need a lot of sleep. I'm dead serious about that. He didn't sleep like the rest of us do. I don't know why his body functioned that way, but that was true. But he would read the Bible and study five hours a day, every day. Would it surprise you to know that he was in a debate one time? They were debating in front of a, uh, they had a, all they had was a, one of those lights, you know, hanging down, you know, on a string, so to speak. All the, all the bugs were, you know, fluttering all around. And as he's speaking, the, one of the bugs flew into his mouth and he got, <laughs> he started to choke. And finally he, 
he spit it out. He said he was a stranger, and I took him in. He was lukewarm, and I spewed him out. Well, you can do that if you know the Word of God. If you're familiar with the Word of God. We ought to be able to use it to go through every one of our needs in life. And that's effectively what Paul is saying. And then what does he tell us to do about it? Meditate on these things. The word there is our word that we get logic from. So he's saying, logic your way through it. Now, I really like a definition I picked up again from A.T. Robertson, the fellow I talked about this morning. He said it this way, deliberate and prolonged contemplation as if one is weighing a mathematical problem. What he's saying is take these things that we're supposed to think about and ponder on them and ponder on them until your life gets to flowing in the direction that God wants it to. You've worked out the problem God's way. That's the idea. Happiness? Happiness, no doubt about it, can be found in thinking about the right things. But also, put your lessons into practice. You know, I've known some pretty smart people. I mean, way, way smarter than I'd ever think about being. But, but they couldn't do a thing in the world with it. They were brilliant. There's a fellow, you know, that I read about just the other day. He's like 82 years old, and he just got, and I don't even remember how many degrees the guy has. He's going for another one. And he's a perpetual student in life. But here's the problem. If you spend all your time in the classroom, you never get out and apply it, it's worthless. It's just a bunch of information. That's all it is. We Christians need to know the importance of putting our lessons into action or into practice. So look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, where he says, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me. How did Paul teach? You ever thought about that? How did he teach? Well, he taught by, by words. That's one way. But did you notice something else in this list? He taught by example. He taught by life. And seen in me. Do you see that? Does that click with all of us? It did with me. Wow. Not just tell it. You don't, you've got to be able to tell it, yes, but you've got to be able to show it. Show people how to do it. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. So, think about his other writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand. You hear him? How did he teach his lessons? I preached it to you. What did you preach, Paul? Well, he says, I preached the gospel. That's what I did. I preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Look at uh, 1 Thessalonians in chapter 2, verse 13. He says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Again, notice, how did Paul uh, deliver the message? How did he show each person what they ought to do? First thing he did was he taught them. He delivered it, preached it, whatever the case may be. But it didn't stop there, did it? He also did it by example. Turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul in verse 17 calls for the elders from Ephesus to come to Miletus. Now, I was trying to think of anything that would be anywhere close to like that in in on our maps, and I'm not sure I can tell you one that would be. But let me explain it this way. Ephesus is an inland city, but it's not very far inland. Its port city, that's its kind of its sister or companion city, is Miletus. Well, Paul is traveling by boat, and he, he knows if he goes to Ephesus, the brethren are going to want him to stay. You know how that works. Think about that Old Testament character, the 
that comes to get his bride and take her back home. And the daddy keeps saying, oh, it's too late. Just stay one more day. I'll fix you a good meal. Every day he gets up, same story. Finally, the guy just says, look, I got to go. And it leads to disaster, but that's a whole different story. That's from the book of Judges, if you want to read that sometime. But that's, Paul couldn't go to Ephesus. He didn't have time right then to do that. But he needed to talk to these elders. And so he calls them, and in verse 18, Luke picks it up. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me uh, by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. I find it interesting. If you look at the beginning of Acts, the very opening chapter, the, the writer Luke says, I wrote the former message to you, Theophilus. What did he say? Of all that Jesus began to, watch it, do and teach. When Paul's talking to these elders, what order does he put it in? You know when I came there what I did. How I lived. Is he easy to listen to? You know he is. Because he doesn't tell you what to do and then not do it himself. Instead, he sets the example and then he tells the message. Brethren, that ought to be the way it is for us, don't you think? If you wonder why on occasions our our children, yours and mine, don't live it like they ought to, maybe it's because we talk it, but we don't live it either. Is that a possibility? Well, on some occasions, I think it is. I think it's the way we live. And so Paul lets us know that, that teaching is done by those two means, by both speaking it, of course, but also by living it. Then he goes on, having reminded them of what he said, let's go back to verse 9 again and read it all the way through. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. These do. The word that is used there is another one of those linear words. That is, keep on doing it. Don't just do it one day. Do it every day. It's a constant. It's a regular thing in the life of a Christian. You know what you ought, how you ought to live, live it. That's what Paul is saying. Don't just live it on Sunday. Too many folks are Sunday morning Christians. We don't want to be those folks. We want to be a Monday morning Christian too. And a Tuesday. And a Wednesday. And a Thursday. And a Friday. And a Saturday. When they see us, they ought to know Whose we are. Did you hear that? W-H-O-S-E. Whose we are. Because of the way that we live. And that's exactly what Paul urged on them. So, when he wrote again to the the Corinthian brethren, we already saw verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now watch verse 2. By which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. It's not enough to hear the truth. I'm going to go a step further. It's not enough to know the truth. You've got to go beyond that. And what does he say about it? He says you've got to hold it fast. How are you going to demonstrate that? By the way you live it. That's how we're going to demonstrate it. Paul put it a different way when he wrote to the Galatian Christians, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. Don't give up on good works. Eventually, God's going to give you a harvest. When's that going to happen? Well, in the judgment at least. It may happen before then, but it sure will in the day of judgment. So happiness, happiness is found in putting into practice the things you've learned. But then it's also found in being content. Be content. 
That's what Paul goes on to next. Let's, let's look at him as he continues, verses 10 and 11 of Philippians 4. But I rejoiced, now look, notice, where did he rejoice? In the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This is one of those words I look up, and I read it, and I say, i got to think about that a while. Because what this means is, this word content means self-sufficient. And I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute, self in Christ, are you self-sufficient? Well, Paul uses that word, content, self-sufficient, but in just a minute we're going to see how he got there. And when we do, it'll all tie together. It'll come, it'll come like it ought to. Is contentment important? Well, I believe it is. But does the world want you to be content? That's easy to answer. If you're content with the automobile you have now, you're not going to buy another one. So they want you to be discontented. They, they want you to be persuaded that, really? You're not enjoying life like you could if you just got a new car or truck or whatever it is that you're buying. That's the way they function. Now, I just used one example. You can think of a hundred more, can't you? They want you to be discontented with what you have. That's their whole goal in life. I can't live if I don't have, you name it, you know, whatever it is. Paul says, no, I'm content, and that's pretty important. Look at the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. Here's what Paul says. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. <clears throat> I can't tell you how many years in my preaching that I thought there were three things that we absolutely, that God would provide for us. Food, clothing, and shelter. I promise you, that's what I thought. And I, I probably even said it from the pulpit, maybe in the classroom, I don't know. That's what I thought. But if you go back, as I was forced to, see, the way I used to study when I was younger is I would commit that I would preach all the way through the Sermon on the Mount. And that forced me to study. By the way, that's the way I realized that I didn't know what I was talking about when it came to fasting. Just as an example. I had to change my whole thinking on it. Because I didn't, I didn't understand it. Until after I'd studied it, starting with the Sermon on the Mount. Well, I got in the Sermon on the Mount, read that that we read this morning, remember? Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. And what did I discover? Food, clothing. There's no shelter there. If you look at Jesus, when they come to him, they say, you know, where are you staying? He says, foxes have holes, birds have their nests, and some, some man doesn't have anywhere to stay. Huh? No shelter? No. That's not a guarantee. So we're already, every one of us in this audience tonight, no matter what your shelter looks like, you're already way ahead. Because we got food, clothing, and shelter. We got a third thing that God didn't even promise us. When you look at what the Apostle Paul tells the young preacher Timothy, what does he emphasize? Food, clothing. That's all. That's it. We have convinced ourselves we need more than we need. We've turned, you all know the whole truth about it? We turned our wants into needs. That's what we've done. And it's made a mess of our lives. Paul didn't turn wants into needs. He learned to be content. Self-sufficient. No, wait a minute. How did he get there? Well, let's go back and let's look at verses 12 and 13 because now he explains it to us. I know how to be abased 
and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. Now watch it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How are you self-sufficient, Paul? I rely on Christ. That's how I do it. You can be self-sufficient. I can be self-sufficient if we turn it all over to Christ. If it's all in His control, then we are we're well. We will do well. And here's the beauty of it. We'll be happy. We'll be really happy. One of the greatest lessons I think I ever learned was really in my first trip to Malawi, Africa. I'd already been to Guyana, I think the year before. But the brethren wanted me to go to Malawi and teach in the preacher training schools. And I went and I saw people that lived in mud huts. And I mean, they made their own bricks. That's how they did it. And the roof, well, the roof was made out of sticks with, with uh, grass laid on top of it. It was elephant grass, so it's a little taller than your grass. Well, maybe not. Mine gets kind of high. But anyway, it's big grass, tall grass. And they'd spread that out on those, on those, that thatched work that they had on the roof. And, you know, I, I can't, I have never seen so many smiling, happy faces in all my life. I mean, you couldn't go anywhere but that they weren't smiling. And I'm thinking, you don't have anything. Where's your, and of course, not back then, but now, where's your cell phone? How in the world can you be happy without a cell phone? Where's your computer? What, what happened to your smart TV and, and your automobile? Uh, you, you, you know, how are you happy? Well, I'll tell you. Because they put their, their approach to happiness in the right place. And I learned from them. When I came back, suddenly I, I began to differentiate in my own life. The difference between wants and needs. Needs, you got to have. Food, clothing. If you're going to keep, keep operating on this earth, you're going to need those. But everything else, it's just gravy, if you want to put it that way. It's just wonderful blessings that God has given us. So today, we've seen God's formula for happiness. And it's a pretty good formula, don't you think? Rejoice in the Lord. There's the beginning of it all. Have a patient spirit. Do not worry, but instead pray. And then think about the right things. And having done that, put your, your learning into action. Put it into practice. Make it a part of your life. And then ultimately, be content. Now, learn to be satisfied with what you have. Why? Because you've got the Lord. And you can't beat that. There's no way you can beat it. If we rejoice in the Lord, then everything else, why? It becomes a lot less important. Are you ready to be happy? If you're unhappy, if you're in Christ and you're unhappy, I'm going to tell you, probably you're like I was and sometimes am. Somewhere you got a misplaced emphasis. It needs to be changed. Maybe you need to ask for prayers of the church about it. I don't know. It's a possibility. And certainly that's available according to James chapter 5, verse 16. But if you're outside of Christ, we've shown you where the happiness is. It's in the Lord. That's where it's found. We want to see you there before this meeting is over tonight. And so we're begging you, come while we sing. I can
those who didn't have an opportunity to take the role. So he has to get the auditorium right now, and to my right, to go to B2. I've been hoarse all day, so let's say one verse. 657, we're going to close the song. 657. When with the Savior we enter the glory, won't it be wonderful day? And in the troubles and cares of the story, won't it be wonderful day? Won't it be wonderful day? Having no burdens to bear. Dear Lord, thank you for the swamp day you've given us to come this morning and worship you and hear your word and also this evening, Lord, and please be with the ones that weren't able to make it due to sickness and um, Lord, just be with them, Lord, and please help us love and trust in one another and seek true happiness and please be with us at the next point of time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 